Okay, so we started doing the Ten Characteristics of a Teacher of God that's in the Manual for Teachers of a Course. And we managed to do one each side. We we're, done, uh, we're up to three today. Um, there's a connection between all of them. So therefore, there's, there's a reason why one is one, and two is two, and three is three, and four is four. And you see that as the process. So the one we did last time was honesty. And it says, honesty, <clears throat> oops, now that I've got this thing, okay, here. Right, but honesty, all of the traits of God teach us rest on trust. So trust is where we start. The reason we start with trust is we are trusting there is a God. There is a law, there is a principle, there is a reason why we are here. There is something to learn, and we trust that God has given us that answer, right? It's not just chaos. All of the trusts of God rest on trust. Once that has been achieved, the others cannot fail to follow. So honesty is next. Uh, if you just think about uh, who is it the easiest for you to be honest with? Those you trust, right? So if you uh, trust your therapist, it's a little easier to be honest with your therapist than it might be under so other or a friend that you know that you feel confident about, you can trust. You can always trust God, right? God will not be, betray you, right? You can always trust the Holy Spirit. Take anything to the Holy Spirit, right? Which really means literally looking at it yourself, right? So if you're really honest about a problem that you've had, you know, you'll look at it yourself. But let's say your uh, drinking is a problem and if you're honest, but you'll admit that it's a problem, right? And that something needs to be done about it. So then now you're willing to take the next step. But you have to be, you can't be in denial. You can't be saying that there's no problem here, if there's obviously a problem there, right? So tolerance is the next one. God's <laughs> teachers do not judge. In, in a way, I think that we know this, and this is going to sound like a rep repetitious, but we're going to do all of them, so let's look at this. God's teachers do not judge. Oops, I'm sorry about that finger situation here. Um, to judge is to be dishonest, for to judge is to assume a position you do not have. And that must be true for everything and every situation, especially sometimes those situations in which you think you have a right to be judgmental, but you really, first of all, the course at one point says you couldn't possibly know all the facts behind any given situation. So you don't know why somebody is behaving, say, the way that they're behaving. You're making judgments about their behavior, not realizing there's a host of things going on, maybe health issues, maybe relationship issues that, that are reflecting into the, that coming out in behavior that you don't know anything about at all, right? Uh, you remember uh, Silver Lining Playbook? There's a line there where <clears throat> in the movie, uh, Robert De Niro's character is kept screaming, you're judging me, you're judging me. <laughs> it's like judging is the one thing that we don't, you, you can't judge me, right? That's what they were saying in the movie. That's why he's implying that, you know, you, you're making judgments about me. You have no right to be making these judgments, right? No one wants to be judged. And I might add that if you are being judged by someone, uh, particularly a friend, uh, like a wife or a husband. <laughs> listen. I mean, listen very carefully to what's being said and just sort of see if there's anything, is there some truth in there? Is there maybe something that I could change? Rather than just immediately becoming defensive. And in the defense, you know, the ego is going to jump to the defense. Don't jump to the defense. Relax. Listen. Maybe there's something here that's really worthwhile. Give it a little bit of time to settle in, right? 
Judgment destroys honesty and shatters trust. Let's see how it relates back. It always relates back. Judgment is a function of the ego unknown to God. God does not judge. So there's no, quote, unforgivable sin in that sense, in God's eyes, right? Because God knows that you're sleeping, right? That you have yet to awaken. And awakening means that you wouldn't behave in that way, right? Uh, let's go on. The basic law of judgment, the choice to judge rather than to know, is the cause of the loss of peace. So now we're, we're, we're putting judgment in the same position as perception. Remember, we said earlier that perception is inherently judgmental. And just think about the, the truth of that. I mean, without negative or positive, we look out on the world, we look at each other, we make all kinds of judgments about each other all the time, don't we? Honestly? Right? All the time, yes. And we're always doing it, right? So the thing to do is, is not to make a thing about the judgment. The thing is just to see it and to let it be what it is, <clears throat> and then also to let it go. Right? Not make it, it not, don't say it's not a problem. So that's a difference. That's all it is, just a difference, right? Um, when the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged, it means that if you judge the reality of others, you will be unable to avoid judging your own. It always comes back. Everything comes back, right? That's why if you, if you want to be helpful, I mean, if you want help, help. <laughs> it always comes back. Sure. You got a mic? No. No. Is it on? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, I don't know if this is something everybody's had sort of a similar experience, but for me, uh, something I'm uh, kind of proud of, but I was on jury duty a few weeks ago, and I was being interviewed for a very uh, big case. This woman was, had stolen like millions of dollars from banks and, in, and impersonated a German uh, princess, and it was like the movies, she's sort of a good-looking young woman, and anyway, so I'm sitting there thinking, can I really do this? And, and so I finally came to the conclusion that, no, I couldn't, I couldn't judge her. And, um, and, and the, you know, the judge says, well, would you all be willing to um, um, pass judgment? And, but then I'm the one who has to, uh, what do you call it, you know, say what the, what the penalty is, you know? And I just, the more, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to be on the case. I didn't want to spend a month there because it's a big trial anyway. Right. But I, I didn't want to get out of it for that reason. So I had to really, like, see what was going on inside myself. So I realized, no, I can't do this. So it's scary because there's a judge and all these lawyers and policemen <laughs> with guns. And, and in a way, I'm starting to think, well, are they going to arrest me for, like, not wanting to play the game that they're playing? <laughs> So uh, I was really, and then, and then I remembered like that we're all the light of the world, you know? So I thought, okay, I can say what I have to say and be the light of the world. I'm here to be the light of the world, to say, no, I'm not gonna do this. And then above the judge, it says, in God we trust, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, that's surely not really, that's not what's happening here at all. So, but I told him, you know, I told him how I, I told him how I wouldn't do it, uh -huh. and that um, and that I pointed up there. I said, "You see, you see what it says up there? I, that's what I believe, and it's for him, not for me." And I didn't want to explain that ju God doesn't judge either. You know, I thought that would be going too far. Yeah, right. So, I, uh, but anyway, it was something I was really, I'm really like thought, wow, I've, that was a that was a brave thing I did. Yeah. So, anyway, and about judging and. Okay. So you're not on the jury? Oh, no, they put me on right away. No, of course not. They said, we want you out, out, get out, as far away as <laughs> I've often found that I can get out just by saying I'm a minister. Oh, well, then you must be judgmental. <laughs> okay. 
So, you know, this is one of my favorite quotes, let him be what he is, seek not to make of love an enemy, because you never know. If you want to see, close your eyes. Toleration, toleration is the greatest gift of the mind. This is from Helen Keller. Is the greatest gift of the mind. It requires the same effort of the brain that it takes to balance oneself on a bicycle. <laughs> it's funny that, that you know, a blind lady can say that who couldn't possibly ride a bicycle, right? But she could understand it. Tolerance <clears throat> enjoys sharing ideas, interests, and communalities. Being tolerant, we allow each other to be who they are so we can be who we are. Being tolerant, we forgive ourselves for our mistakes. And that's something you really got to do a lot too, you know, just, okay, you made a mistake, you made a mistake, you got to let it go and go on. Okay. <clears throat> so to see clearly, first remove the beam. So the co this is a, in the very first chapter of the Course. <clears throat> it says, removing the beam involved four steps. First, you believe that what God created can... You believe that what God... I will eventually learn this. You believe that what God created can be changed by your own mind. Second, you believe that what is perfect can be rendered imperfect or lacking. Third, you believe that you can distort the creations of God, including yourself. Fourth, you believe that you can create yourself and the direction of your own creation is up to you. So this is just talking about how the, how the ego sees the thing, right? from our, what we put on top of situations. Let's just look at one. You believe that what God created can be changed by your mind. That's an impossibility. But still, somehow that we would hold on to that. Right? And let's go on. <clears throat> not judging does not mean, <clears throat> am I having chicken or fish for dinner? Am I going to wear my blue or my brown shirt? What movie shall I go see? It just means giving up analysis, interpretation, and especially condemnation. The thing of saying, this is a problem here, there's something wrong, it should be fixed, and I know how to fix it. <laughs> then you're really in trouble if you think you know how to fix it. If you did not feel guilty, you could not attack, for condemnation is the root of attack. I think that probably the thing that I've said here most often more than anything else is if you get nothing else out of this, get, do not attack, right? Because that is always, 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 always a mistake, right? You think that there's some justification for it, some validity for it. It's, it's not the case. And if you look deeply enough, you'll see that that's true, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't situations which need help and discipline and clarification, but it can be done without attack. It is a judgment of one by another as unworthy of love and deserving of punishment. Okay. Only the self-accused condemn. If you prepare to make a choice that will result in different outcomes, <clears throat> there is first one thing that must be overlearned. Do you all know what overlearning is? Hmm? Well, if you don't know what overlearning is, overlearning is you learn something and then after you've learned it, you, you learn it again. You do it, it's, all, it's like mastery. You, it's like saying the difference between an amateur and a professional is that an amateur practices until they get it right, professional practices until they can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. So you get it right, you learn the language, you learn the piece, and then you play the piece again, even after you've already mastered it. Right? It must become a habit, that's interesting, a habit of response. So typical of everything you do that it becomes your first response to all temptations. There's no, I'm working on a, a section in the new book about habit. It says, as, <clears throat> it says in the Course that miracles should be habits. They should not be under conscious control. Consciously selected miracles can be misguided, right? So it just, you see the need, you respond to the need. It's that 
automatic. You don't have to think about, should I respond to this need? Or shouldn't I respond to this need? You just see it, you just, you just do the right thing right off the bat. It's not a question about it at all. Learn this and learn it well. <clears throat> For it is here, delay of happiness is shortened by a span of time you cannot realize. So here, Eric, you've got your um, judges. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Supreme Court. If it doesn't look supreme, it's supreme, right? <laughs> with all the nine judges in the back there, right? And the record is Tolerance does not mean to tolerate in a judgmental way. I read a book this past summer where the guy was talking about, it, he says he was arguing for something of not tolerance. <clears throat> he said tolerance was enough. We need acceptance. Mm -hmm. Acceptance being a sort of a state that takes it, it's, that you're not just tolerating it, but you're allowing it, right? As we change our minds about sexual preferences and that sort of thing, right? Judges sit on benches raised up from the ground. To judge is to be above a brother or sister, to see someone else as lower than oneself. That's why we've got this picture here. You never hate your brother for his sins, but only for your own. This is very similar to something we said last week. Whatever form this sin appears to take, it but obscures the fact that you believe them to be yours and therefore merit a just attack. That's what you really got to look at. Of course, begs us in more than one instance. If you see a problem in a brother, please realize that's in you. And it's in you because that's one of the reasons you see it so clearly. You can pick it out, <clears throat> right? And if you can pick it out and you can see it so clearly, then it's your problem too. And that's where it needs to be dealt with, not in some external place. John, could you leave that on there for a second? Sure. Just write it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. You could also look at Chapter 31 in the course. <laughs> <laughs> But notice that's chapter 30. That's, this is the last chapter, and it's uh, three sections in on the last chapter. Oops, sorry. Got it? All right, I'll go on. The reasoning by which the world is made, on which it rests, by which it is maintained, is simply this. You are the cause of what I do. Your presence justifies my wrath. While you attack, I must be innocent. And what I suffer from is your attack. Remember lesson 31 from the Course, right? <clears throat> I am not a victim of the world, I see. Really watch out for being a victim. It's really important you not see that that's what's going on. That this is something that, <clears throat> that First of all, it requires a response for you, from you, whatever the situation is. So the best way to respond is to be responsible. <laughs> all right? And don't run away and don't deny it and don't per se that it's somebody else's fault. The world loves that. Uh, no one who looks upon this reasoning exactly as this could fail to see it does not follow and makes no sense, yet it seems reasonable because it looks as if the world were hurting you. Do not be a victim. And even if you're a victim, <laughs> I mean, you still want us to have the right attitude toward it, right? It doesn't mean that you, if you get run over in the street, you're a victim of the car that ran over you, but who knows what the circumstances are beyond that, right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't go to trial, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean the person shouldn't be held responsible. I don't know what anything is for. That's also true. All right. So heaven is perfectly unambiguous. <clears throat> Everything is clear and bright and calls forth one response. There is no interpretation. <clears throat> the, 
there is a sense of peace so deep that no dream in the world has ever brought even a dim image of what it is, of heaven. The master has no possession. The more he does for others, the happier he is. The more he gives to others, the wealthier he is. This is Lao Tzu. Okay. There's a way of finding certainty right here, right now. Refuse to be a part of fearful dreams, whatever form they take. For you will lose your identity in them. If you're getting caught up in, say, a political situation at work, just for example, right? Refuse to be a part of fearful dreams. You see fearful dream going on in a family situation or in a work situation or in any situation. But don't play the game. Just simply say that, you, that you, just you're out of it. You know, don't jump in there. <clears throat> and, and Ken Wapner, one of Ken Wapner's favorite sayings was, don't start throwing sand around. Mm -hmm. Right? Stay out of the sandbox. Stay out of the sandbox. That's what my mother told me. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you just you could have learned that, that would have been so nice. <laughs> I'm not throwing sand, really. I just... <laughs> playing with the boy in the sandbox. <laughs> Do never think you can see and sin in anyone except yourself. This is, what, remember this, last week? Last week, I keep saying week. Last month. Do not think you can ever see sin in anyone except yourself. That is such a heavy-duty line mm -hmm. that I repeated it again this month because it means that if I'm seeing it, the problem is in me. So if it's in me, then that's where only I can deal with it and only I can fix it. We're going to get to gentleness. Nice. Huh? That's nice. Pardon? That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, yeah gentleness. <laughs> yeah, <it's nice. laughs> okay. So Eleanor Callahan goes to the post office to buy stamps before Christmas. And somebody points out to her that there is a machine that she can buy stamps from in the lobby of the post office. And she says, yes, I know, but the machine won't ask me about my arthritis. <laughs> you know, we really kind of we want that, that, that loving kindness, you know, the ability to, there's a postman that works at the post office that I go to all the time. He just has the most incredible relationship with everybody that comes up. He knows everybody's names if you're a, a regular at all, and it always has something worthwhile to cheerfully share with you. It's a nice experience. He's doing it. It's, a, it's his ministry, right? He's constantly having people being put in front of him that he can uh, make them feel good. That's why I honor Callahan. Where there is a call for love, you must give it because of what you are. Now, it's interesting because the section on gentleness starts off by talking about harm, just the opposite of that. It says, harm is impossible for God's teachers. They can neither harm nor be harmed. It's impossible. Harm is the outcome of judgment. <clears throat> it is a dishonest act that follows a dishonest thought. A verdict of guilt upon a brother and therefore on oneself. The important point here is therefore on oneself. Right? It is the end of peace and the denial of learning. I'm not willing to learn. You always be willing to, to learn, especially when somebody confronts you. Right? It demonstrates the absence of God's curriculum and is replaced by insanity. Insanity is saying there is a problem out there and it needs to be fixed. <clears throat> harm is impossible for God's teachers. They can neither harm nor be harmed. Harm is the outcome of judgment. It's a son of cycle. I said that already. It is a very, the whole thing is the same, isn't it? <laughs> Somebody did not edit these files very well. I don't know who to blame. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 could, it, it couldn't have been me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Paul, you got to do better to help next time. Okay. <laughs> oh, Paul, I can blame Paul. That's good. <laughs> it 
The ego is neither gentle nor kind. Find fault with any brother means finding fault with oneself. Punishment is unknown to God and thus unknown to right-mindedness. God literally cannot think an unkind thought, and neither can you. That's a nice thought, isn't it? That you cannot, and if you find yourself thinking an unkind thought, you want to think about, well, why did I think that thought? What, where did that, why would I think something that would be hurtful? Would, would, would you really ne never want, or, be, or resentful, or angry, or attacking, right? <clears throat> Are thoughts dangerous? Then, to bodies, yes. This is quoting the Course. A judgment having been made, the ego may decide that punitive measures are called for. That's what the, that's what <clears throat> the ego will always do, will call for punitive measures. So what do we, we put people in jail. I read an, an editorial about whether or not the people that were involved in the scandal regarding the um, uh, paying of the students to get into the college should go to jail or not. It was an auditorial. Maybe there's another way. Huh? Yes, of course. Yes. Maybe there's other alternatives besides jail for a nonviolent kind of crime. It's, it, was worth, it was worth thinking about to just to read that idea. <clears throat> God's teachers are wholly gentle. Who would choose the weakness that must come from harm in place of the unfailing, all-encompassing, and limitless strength of gentleness? Gentleness is really strong, right? Gentleness and kindness are synonyms. The Course uses the words interchangeably, kindness more frequently than gentleness. Gentleness is patient, steadfast, and the very opposite of harm. Um, the might of God's teachers lies in their gentleness, for they have understood their evil thoughts came neither from God's Son nor His creation. This is a picture of Helen and Ken. And I just wanted to say, I always found, you know, we go to, I went to both of these for counseling, Helen, until she died, and then after Helen passed, Ken took over in the counseling department. And I found, it, well, I was thinking back one day, neither one of them were ever judgmental about the kind of stuff that I would get into trouble with. Usually a woman. <laughs> well, I was just being honest. <laughs> I was in my 30s then and struggling. <laughs> um, so this is Ken now talking. He says, I have frequently made the public comment that one of the most important lessons a student of the Course in Miracles learn is how to be able to disagree with someone else, whether that person be on, another spirit, on a spiritual path, students of a Course in Miracles without being an attack. Now that's a, that requires some time. How do you disagree without it being an attack? It does not have to be an attack. If you do it right, it won't be an attack. It'll, and the other person will understand it's an attack. It's just a, it's a, a matter of factual kind of thing that you might face, say, at business, right, where you have a disagreement with a, a colleague at work about how a project is to get done. You see it a different way. It doesn't mean you're attacking them. It's just that you see, you're seeing it a different way, and you're trying to find the best solution. That's all it means. Okay? You want to be happy. You want peace. You do not have them now because your mind is totally undisciplined. Jesus says in the Gospel that he is gentle and humble in heart. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. We burden ourselves with problems about things like what do the people think about us or things that we maybe made a mistake on or did wrong. We condemn ourselves. He did not become stressed. We're talking about Jesus. When the world fell apart around him, he remained centered. I mean, that was the, that's the image that we get. We're, we're coming upon, the fact is it's next, next Sunday, isn't it? A week from today. Uh, a week from today is, is Easter. So, um, and he actually says in the Course in Miracles that 
he deliberately chose to do this, he did not have to go to the cross. By that I mean he could have avoided it. All he had to do was not go back to Jerusalem. <laughs> Walk the other way. <laughs> you know, but he goes back to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to be arrested. But he says it's a demonstration of that under the most radical of all sort of circumstances, he still maintained his peace because he knew the truth. The truth was he was the son of God, right? In fact, is uh, when Pilate says to him, uh, uh, "Are you the king of the uh, king?" and he says, "Yes, but my kingdom's not of this world." <laughs> but not this world, but I'm the king, right? Perfect happiness calls for main, <clears throat> perfect happiness calls for maintenance of sanity and gentleness in a harsh and sometimes insane world. If you're in doubt about any, <clears throat> what the right process is, it's always kindness. You are not proficient in the mind's discipline that's required. <clears throat> you may need to repeat, let me not forget my function quite often to help you concentrate. It's the re that repetition that begins to enable us to, to really see it. <clears throat> God's teachers are wholly gentle. They need the strength of gentleness. But is this that the function of salvation becomes easy? Peace is stronger than war. Nothing is stronger than gentleness. Gentleness, like an ever-flowing stream, can wear away the roughest edges. It's a good illustration how a stream will slowly smooth everything out. Loving kindness and gentleness are stronger than anger and attack. Bullies and tyrants melt in the presence of loving kindness. Then I wanted to, somebody may know this, this story. Ram Dass tells this story in his book, How Can I Help, um, about being on a <clears throat> subway train, you may have heard this story, in Tokyo. And um, a drunk man comes onto the train. And there is a <clears throat> judo master standing at one end of the train. And he sees this disruptive man at the other end. And he's thinking about taking him down, right? But just about that time, another man on the train goes over and helps him up and sits him down and puts his arm, what's wrong, buddy? He's over, he says, I have no wife. I have no job. I, you know, I, you know, he's crying, and the next thing you know, the drunk has got his head on his shoulder, and the man is sort of petting his matted hair, and the drunk is crying, and the whole potential problem of this rough drunk has gone because somebody sought to be gentle instead of to attack him and, and bring him down. Right? That would have just brought, added chaos to the situation rather than provided some sort of healing to the situation. And um, St. Francis of Assisi, if you know, was really probably the main thing that we remember about St. Francis is incredible. He's probably regarded as the most well-known Catholic saint, uh, simply because of his gentleness and the kindness, which he would display uh, with everything, including uh, animals and uh, plant, everything. There's a story, it's probably apocryphal, <laughs> but I'll tell you the story. Um, it, I can't believe this couldn't be a true story, but anyhow, the St. Francis is with his brothers and his robe catches on fire from the fire pool that, that they're sitting around. And some, a brother went to get a bucket of water to throw it on him and he said, oh, no, don't hurt Brother Fire. <laughs> that's what I mean by apocryphal, right? I mean, that's carrying it a bit too far, right? <laughs> Who would choose the weakness that must come from harm is a place of unfailing, all-encompassing, and the limitless strength of gentleness. I think this may be our last slide. Almost. Selfishness and the selfishness of spirit the Dalai Lama said that his, his religion is kindness. Kindness is the law he lives by. Kindness is the very opposite of selfishness. I've said before that selfishness is the main problem for the ego. If you wanted to say this is what it is, 
but the ego is it's selfish. That's the number one characteristic. It takes for itself. That's its problem. On the other hand, this is just the opposite of that. Right? It's really a matter of giving. Right? Selfishness is dishonest and withholding, while kindness is truthful and sharing. It is literally doing unto others as we would have them do to us. The Song of Prayer pamphlets, Jesus speaks of forgiveness is kindness. It's kind to forgive, and we should always be ready to, to do that. And <clears throat> it is one of the beautiful compositions. This is from Dudley Warner, who was a co-author with Mark Twain of The Golden Age. By the way, Mark Twain said about this, just to put it, he will never write a book with another man. <laughs> I mean, he said that because it was just a, it would be, it was a hassle. It became a really big hassle to, to have gone through that whole process of two people trying to edit the same book. But this is Dudley Warner. It's one of the beautiful compensations of life that no one can sincerely try to help another without helping himself, of course. And that's that. Well, this is our last quote. Um, so, uh, this is a Quaker, American Quaker. I had I originally thought that this came from William Penn. When I was a kid, I had this on my wall in my bedroom, and it said William Penn underneath it. Uh, so I always thought that was interesting that when I came across it here, it wasn't William Penn. But, it, but William Penn was also a Quaker, so we can understand why. I shall pass through this world but once. Any good that I can do, or any kindness that I can show, to any human being, let me do it now, and not defer it, for I shall not pass this way again. Right. And that is our last slide. Um, I wanted to do a meditation. Did anybody see that clipboard that was going around with the for the blue clipboard with the names on? Do you have that? And then after that, Brad's going to uh, we're going to do a meditation with the music. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm got a beautiful song to play on my phone that's really inspiring. <clears throat> and, and Paul is going to project the lyrics. Okay. I'll get that later. And then, if you will, wait after that. And then we do, we do have the slide of the last of the Lord's Prayer. We'll do that together. So it'll be coming standard. Okay. So this is a five or six minute meditation. <clears throat> so if you want to um, close your eyes, keep quiet, just be very present now. So the phrase that I'm going to repeat today, it says, in quiet I receive God's word today. I was thinking of doing 104, which uh, uh, Yasko did, but... Uh, I decided to use this one instead. This is from Lesson 125 of the Course in Miracles. When I say, I receive, in quiet, I receive God's word today. So I'm going to ask the phrase, say with me, you will say, in quiet, I receive God's word today. Let this day be a day of stillness and quiet listening. Your Father wills you hear his word today. He calls to you from deep within your mind where he abides. Hear him today. No peace is possible until his word is heard around the world. Until your mind in quiet listening accepts the message that the world must hear to usher in the quiet time of peace. Say with me, in quiet I receive God's word today. This world will change through you. No other means can save it, for God's plan is simply this. The Son of God is free to save himself, given the word of God to be his guide, forever in his mind and at his side to lead him surely to his Father's house by his own will, forever free as God. He has not led to be forced but only love. He is not judged, but only sanctified. Say with me, in quiet, I receive God's word today. In stillness, we will hear God's voice today without intrusion of our petty thoughts, without our personal desires, 
without all judgment of his holy word. We will not judge ourselves today, for what we are cannot be judged. We stand apart from all the judgments which the world has laid upon the Son of God. It knows him not. Today we will not listen to the world, but wait in silence for the word of God. Say with me, in quiet I receive God's word today. Hear, holy child of God, your Father speak. His voice would give to you his holy word to spread across the world the tidings of salvation and the holy time of peace. We gather at the throne of God today, the quiet place within the mind where he abides forever in the holiness that he created and will never leave. Say with me, in quiet I receive God's word today. He has not waited until you return your mind to him to give his word to you. He has not hid himself from you while you have wandered off a little while from him. He does not cherish the illusions which you hold about yourself. He knows you and wills that you remember as part of him, regardless of your dreams, regardless of the maddening thoughts, that his, world, that his will is not his own. Say with me, in quiet I receive God's word today. Today we speak to you, his voice awaits your silence, for his word cannot be heard until the mind is quiet for a while and meaningless desires have been stilled. Await his word in quiet. There's a peace within you to be called upon today to help make ready your mind's most holy mind to hear the voice for its creator speaks. Say with me, in quiet I receive God's word today. He speaks from nearer than your heart to you. His voice is closer than your hand. His love is everything you are, and that he is the same as you, and you the same as he. It is your voice to which you listen as he speaks to you. It is your word he speaks. It is the word of freedom and of peace, of unity of will and purpose with no separation nor division in the single mind of father and of son. In quiet, listen to yourself today and let him tell you God has never left his son and you have never left yourself. Say with me, in quiet, I receive God's word today. Only be quiet. You need not rule but this. Let your practice today lift you above the thinking of the world and free your vision from the body's eyes. Only be still and listen. You will hear the word in which the will of God, the Son joins in his Father's will, at one with it, with no illusions interposed between the holy and divisible and true. Be still a moment and remind yourself, you have a special purpose for this day. One last time, say with me, in quiet I receive God's word today. We're going to switch back over to uh, other slides. It's the very last one, Paul. So while we're doing that, uh, just a reminder that in May, we're on the first Sunday instead of the second Sunday, and we're going to have Christina Strutt here. Uh, and she's uh, very clear. That's what I like about Christina. And it, it's the, the James. I'd like to mention I have friends coming uh, May third to put David Hoffmeister's book together. This moment is your miracle. We're going to have it here May third, seven to nine. Wow! So that's a busy weekend. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of congestion. That's why I didn't want to. But that's it's going to be here if anybody's close to come by. Um, the wonderful people, um, uh, Greg and Jen uh, Donovan were married, and um, they put these, this book together for David. Right. Right. 
Oh yes, and don't forget May. Uh, it's a Wednesday night, so it's, May is a really full month. Um, come meet Robert if you've never met Robert. Robert lives in England. He's from here, but uh, he's been in England for a long time now, and so he doesn't get here very often. When I say here, the states, I don't think of California. Uh, and if you want to go with us to uh, have a bite to eat together, meet us over at <clears throat> Saigon Market, just two blocks down on 12th and then one block to the left. So this is called the Lord's Prayer from A Course in Miracles. It's the last, it's on page 350. It's the last paragraph on chapter 16, facing chapter 17. It's very easy to find. And it's good to uh, think about memorizing. It's just because it sounds similar to So let's say this together. We pause at every comma. We stop at every period. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the mind, which created you and which you love. Amen. You notice the similarity with what some of the stuff that we were talking about uh, earlier, uh, like at the top, in which there are no other... Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? That's because ours is perfect. It's already perfect, right? The sleep of forgetfulness, the dreaming of the world, is only unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and love. It's already there. It's always been there. You know, and you don't have to go asking God for forgiveness <laughs> because in God's eyes, you didn't do anything wrong, you just fell asleep, and you'll wake up again. So that's what matters, right? So thank you. I'll see you all. Next. <laughs>